this place through this place like a whirlwind 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 like a whirl through it but long through this place long through this place hey but long through this place Now let Chicago cry out. Come on, Chicago. Let your desperation and your hunger for our God feel, feel this place. Feel this place. Whoa. Let Chicago cry out. Cry out. Cry out. Cry out. For the city. Cry out. Hey. Cry out. Hey. Cry out. For the city. Oh, cry out.
city of God. Woo. Come on, lift those voices. Come on, lift up that heavenly language. people of prayer again oh yes Lord may the fire of baptism in this room tonight let it feel children let it feel women let it feel men oh Jesus, take your place. Jesus. 
For this shall be called the house of words. I shall be called the house of praise. Ooh, I shall be called the house of worship. Ooh, I shall be called the house of praise.
Jesus of the preserving power, you made sure that it didn't win, God. Hey, hey, because I serve the one who already won. It didn't prevail. It didn't work. It didn't prevail. It did not work. It didn't prevail. It did. Come on. Outside of the fire. It didn't prevail. It did not work. The plans of the enemy. It came to naught. I'm not talking about the enemy next to you. But I'm talking about the thing that tried to pursue your destiny. I'm talking about the thing that tried to muzzle your mouth. I'm talking out. I'm talking about the thing that tried to stifle you in a cycle, in a pattern. We declare tonight that it's shut up. This is not a residue type 
of anointing in this room. But this is the transformational type. This is the type that hit Saul and then he changed to Paul. Come on, this is the kind of power that exists in the room. Oh, every blinded eye be open. Every blinded eye be open. Now, come on. In the next three seconds, I want you to lift your voice and I want you to break out in a radical praise. Come on. Because the prison doors are open. Now the prison doors, because the prison doors have been open. Your victory, your deliverance, your healing, your breakthrough warrants a response. You can't just keep taking without responding. So on the count of three, we're going to break open these walls. Oh, come on. children over your body over your mind over your spirit over your body out of your bloodstream out of your kidney every sickness every infirmity every restraint everything that has granted access to your life be destroyed we silence the voice of the enemy we silence the voice of a stranger come on lift it up one more time one, two, three, yeah! La Pandea, so blanda la mate. Come on, le pet so blanda. Ow, I'm so, come on, I'm not just declaring it over you, but I'm declaring that captivity is broken off of me, that restraint that the spirit of Laban would no longer exist over my life. But today, I decree, march, 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 march. This day, I march in to the fullness. I march in. And since coming by God is celebrating a birthday, we declare that every single person in here, you don't just march, but you leap in. Come on. We. I leap over walls. I jump through truth. Over walls. Come on. Come on, some of you begin to leap. Begin to leap. Begin to leap. Begin to leap. Come on. You're leaping out of cycles. You're leaping out of depression. You're leaping out. Hey. Of all limitations. Every glass ceiling. You're breaking it with your leap. Come on. Come on. In the balcony, leap. In every section, leap. Come on. Come on, this leap is generational. That even as you leap, you're leaping for your children. You're leaping for your seed. You're leaping for your seed to come. Ha! And I prophesy, I'm leaping into marriage. Ha! Ha! I'm leaping into promise. I'm leaping into wealth. For wealth and riches are laid up. It's laid up for me. But this year, 
It's not just gonna remain laid up, but this time I will obtain it. Come on, lift your voice one more time. Lift your voice. Come on, lift it because he's worthy. Not because I said it, but because he's worthy. Come on, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Come on. Come on, lift it up because he's worthy. Lift it up because he's worthy. He's worthy of it. Come on. Answer prayers. Come on, may altars be the place of answer prayers. May altars be the place of transformation again. May altars be the place where we respond to you correctly. May altars be the place where we don't just seek for what we would get. But God, we come bearing our all to you. Come on, lift it up, says. Come on, I'm about to move. Woo! Come on, don't miss this. Come on. Come on. Come on, we silence the spirit of fear. Come on. You don't live here anymore. Come on. Come on, fear doesn't live here. There is no fear in the presence of God. Come on. Open your mouth. Come on, that's the sound. That's the sound he wants. That's the sound he wants. That's the sound he's desperate for. Come on. in this room.
you did a great exchange Lord <laughs> oh I made an exchange Lord and it could never be taken away Lord <laughs> oh I made an exchange Lord ah, ah. oh and it could never be taken away Lord I'm no longer a slave a son, hey, 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 hey. oh, I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a son, I am a son, hey, I am a son, I am a son, hey. I Slave to fear. 
for I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear, Woo. but I am a child of God. You got to look at yourself much differently. You gotta open your spiritual eyes and see It's beyond what you are experiencing It's your birthright, it's your inheritance It's your promise to walk in it It's your birthright, it's your inheritance It's your promise to walk in it It's your birthright, it's your inheritance it's the promise So walk in name It's the promise It's the birthright It's the Shouting for the rest of it. My daddy, my daddy, your baby is singing. I'll be singing and dancing and shouting for the rest of eternity.
says, those who sit in heaven laugh. Now, I don't know if you remember last cover by God, but I sang a war song. Whenever you sing rejoice and joy in the face of the enemy, that's a war cry. We all know what happened after that war cry, but guess who was surrounded by a wall of fire? Guess who got proposed to after the year of the bride? So I don't know what you came here for, but I heard the Lord say what tried to kill you, God made you a cure for. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned it around for your good. I'm a witness. Whoever tried to curse you, God said, I turned it into a blessing. So when we sing this part, I want you to take whatever is whatever's harassing you, I want you to put it right here. And when we sing that part, we're going to laugh in the enemy's face. Because those who sit in heaven laugh. And I want you to give it a hearty laugh. And I want you to jump up and down in joy. Because you're not praying and you're not worshiping for victory. You're praying and worshiping from a place of victory. It was already given to you. He who sits in heaven laughs.
Your beloved is singing. We'll be singing and dancing and shouting for the rest of eternity. Lover, my love, your beloved is singing. I'll be singing and dancing and shouting for the rest of eternity. My helper, my helper, your best friend is singing. I'll be singing and dancing and shouting for the rest of it. My husband, my lover, my husband, my lover, your darling is singing. I'll be singing and dancing and for the rest of it. One more time, my daddy, my daddy, my daddy, my daddy. Father, I ask that you would do the impossible today. I ask that you would open the ears of those who have turned a deaf ear to you. Open the eyes of those who have closed them on you. Open the mouths of those too afraid, too broken, too hurt and sad to speak for you. I pray, Father, that the heavens don't open until we open up and get revelation from you tonight. I pray, Father, that done are the gifted with no godly character and integrity. Father, keep your heaven closed until we learn godly character and integrity so that we don't make the gift an idol and throw away the gift giver. Father, let there be a mighty move of God in here tonight. I pray that the move of God is so strong, Father, that you have raised up a generation of people that is able to stop plagues in the realm of the spirit, that you're able to raise up a generation of people, Father, that say, try me if you want, but we'll see whose God is God. I pray that you'll raise up a generation of people that even in the face of criticism, God, and blackballing, they will cry out the name of Jesus Christ and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm gonna be honest with you tonight. I didn't wanna be here. I am Jonah and Nineveh. The only difference is I'm not in the belly of the whale because I said, I'll go, God. But I asked God, I, I sat before God during this meeting, really confused. I said, why do you want me here? What's the point? I said to God, what do you say to a generation who won't read their Bibles? and who have made their doctrine of their feelings Lord. Well, I just don't feel like you should have said it that way. Point it out in the Bible. What do you say to a generation of people who are lukewarm? They're not hot and they're not cold. They're somewhere in between. What do you tell to a generation of people who think they made a covenant with you but break it every day? And they are more loyal to evil covenants than they are to covenants of God because of a perverted hyper grace message. What do you say to a generation who likes to dance and be entertained at church and then go right back out that door and sleep with the same man? What you here for? What am I here for? We often think that, well maybe they don't know better. Y'all smart. You're smart, you know better. And I heard God say, I want you to ask them one question. And the question I heard him say is, who's on the Lord's side? And that is my message for tonight. Who is on the Lord's side? For those of you that came in here tonight in the valley of decisions, God is saying tonight, you're gonna make one. Everybody under the sound of my voice, whether you're in person or watching online, to God says, tonight, you will make a decision. I heard the Lord say there's a plague coming to back to this land. 
Many people call me an Old Testament prophet because I thoroughly enjoyed the Old Testament. But how many of you know that the New Testament covenant is better and I need that one more because it has better promises. So anytime you prophesy things that look like they happen in the Old Testament, people say, well, you're just an Old Testament prophet, then what was COVID? You watch people drop like flies. If that wasn't a plague, I don't know what was. And I heard the Lord say, there's another plague getting ready to hit this earth. We talk about revival, revival, everybody screaming revival. And I heard the Lord say, how dare you utter out your mouth revival without repentance. Whenever something is revived, because the body of Christ, I'm getting ready to go into my message, but there is fruit of repentance. For those of you that say, well, you can't judge me, I repented. I should see it in your behavior. I should see it in your decisions. I should see that you changed your mind about something you were getting ready to do tomorrow. Because repentance has a fruit. And we see the body of Christ doesn't have the fruit of repentance. What I did last month was not in my own doing. It wasn't done by my own strength. It wasn't done by my own power and it wasn't done by my own might. The best marketing strategy could not have done what the Lord did. And I heard the Lord say that it was just a test for the body of Christ and you failed. You may say, well, Tiffany, what were you supposed to do? Number one, you were supposed to read your Bible to know that that delivery was from God. When I spoke to the Holy Ghost about the delivery, I heard him say, nobody tells a woman travailing in labor how loud to deliver a message, or how loud to deliver the baby, depending on how big that baby is. God used a voice of a woman crying out in the wilderness and the body rebelled against the voice of God. Whenever you have a cell in the body that rebels, it turns cancerous. So we got a temperature from the great physician to see what the temperature of the body of Christ was and it was sick. But it also made it easier for you to define who was on the Lord's side. And some of you learned that you weren't. What should the body of Christ have done during those two weeks? The pastors should have pastored. The teachers should have begun teaching their flock. The evangelists should have gone out and drawn in the lost. The prophets were supposed to come in, cry loud and spare not. And everybody stayed in their caves. Everybody, no, you shouldn't fight. But Elijah mocked. First Kings 18 says he mocked the prophets of Baal. I mocked the prophets of Facebook. I mocked them prophets on YouTube. I mocked the prophets of TikTok. And what did I hear y'all say? Stop. Shh. God has it from here. Did anybody tell Esther to stop because God has it from here? Did anybody tell Prophet Daniel to stop because God has it from here? Did anybody tell Prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 18, go ahead and stop because God has it from here? But he wanted me to come and give a message to a generation who doesn't read their Bible who doesn't know what a real prophet is. I had a woman of God email me. She goes, woman of God, I want to caution you. You better stop because your job is to exhort, comfort, and edify the body of Christ. I said, the devil is a liar and so are you. I said, I walk in the office of a prophet. I am not prophetic. I don't have the spirit of prophecy. I don't move in the gift of prophecy. When I get in the prophetic atmosphere, my gift doesn't turn on and off depending on where I'm at. I'm a prophet, which means that my job is to root out, tear down, destroy, pluck up. And after I get done making a mess, I build and I plant. But if you read your Bible, you would know that. So what I saw tonight was God duplicating me and other people. Because of this one girl who said yes to God in her shower, August 2015. If this one girl came unwillingly to God, 
I didn't walk up to an altar wanting to be saved. I don't want to be up here doing this. I didn't ask for this job. I don't even like some people half the time. If we're going to be honest, if God could do this with one girl who said yes, imagine what this world would look like. I heard the Lord saying there's another plague coming to this earth. Revival will stop that plague from hitting the earth. But there will, don't clap yet, there will be no revival without repentance. And people have played with God with repentance for long too much. And God said revival will not come without the spirit of repentance hitting this earth. We have a dead body. And in order for the Lord to revive the body back together again, what do you do when you revive something that's dead? You press on the heart. You press on the heart. You press on the heart of a matter. You press on the heart of people with stony hearts. You press on the heart of people who have walked away from God. You press on the heart of people who have turned their hearts from God. But I heard the Lord say, I'm the God that has the hand, the heart of the king in my hand. And I turn it whichever way I want. And the Bible shows, history shows biblically that history was always shaped through the power a prayer and fasting. But the most important part of fasting that people don't get because fasting gets you a lot of answers. Fasting, I mean, you can start seeing through walls during fasting. Your spiritual life really gets stronger. You can hear people's conversations. You can see what people are doing thousands of miles away. Nothing get past a fasting man of God, a fasting woman of God, nothing at all. But that's not, with all those benefits, that's not the main reason of fasting. The reason you fast is to kill your flesh. The reason you fast is to humble yourself. How do you humble yourself? Repentance. Repentance is not your tears crying because the Bible says that Esau cried many tears, yet he, God did not forgive him. We don't care about your tears anymore. They're cute. But your emotional manipulation will not work on God anymore. As a matter of fact, you can keep your tears tonight because what God is looking for when you leave that is for you to make a different decision. God is looking for when that phone call comes in, you don't answer it and say, tonight I've made a decision. But God is tired of you straddling the fence. Why do I keep bringing up this plague? Because through repentance will come a true move of revival that will hit this earth. And the second that revival hits this earth and you have more than me, and I'm not the only person, just FYI, but you have more than me doing this work. Imagine each and every one of you children included doing this work. That plague would be stopped. That plague would not come nigh you. But a thousand will fall at your side. 10,000 gonna fall at your right hand, but it won't come nigh you, only with your eyes will you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now, I would say how many of you think that you're on the Lord's side and I'm assuming most of you will raise your hands. But we learned, I did a message a few years ago on Matthew 25, the wise versions and the foolish versions. And many people thought that they were never going to be one of the foolish versions until we found out what the definition of foolish was and that meant 90% of the people in here were the foolish virgins, right? The Bible says five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. What is wise? Intelligent, prudent. Somebody that is prudent is economical. They show thought for the future with how they spend money or thought for the future of how they handle situations. They're thoughtful or they're considerate. They're discreet or they're private. But what is foolish? Foolish means you're impious. And impious means you don't show respect or reverence to God, or you're unbelieving, or you're always doubting. Foolish also meant godless. And you may say, well, I am definitely not a godless man or woman of God, but it also means not recognizing or obeying God. Any of you who got last set of instructions from God and you did not do it, you are considered godless, according to the Bible. I'm gonna say that one more time. Any of you 
who God told to do something and you disobeyed God, you are considered godless. Foolish also meant heedless, H-E-E-D-L-E-S-S. -E -E and heedless means showing a reckless lack of or care of attention or daydreaming. It means to be blind to. It means to be deaf to. It means to be oblivious to. And many of you sitting in here are blind to, deaf to, oblivious to. You open up your Bible and you get to daydreaming. You're heedless. You hear instructions from God and you don't obey it. You're heedless. You are one that God considers the foolish virgin. So when I ask you who is on the Lord's side, that is why I ask you that question because you have to understand by definition, most of you are not on the Lord's side. Now, I get this scripture from Exodus 32, 26. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. So write that down as your scripture reference for today. Exodus 26, 36. Now, why does God want you to pick a side as loving as God is, as understanding as God is, as hyper-graced as God is? Why is he asking you, why is God being so mean today? Why is God putting down his foot and saying, pick a side or I'm pick one for you? Why is God requiring your fidelity and your faithfulness tonight? Because he's jealous. Somebody say, he's jealous. Now, I know you don't like this talk about being jealous, but I do want you to know that God's ways aren't our ways and his thoughts aren't our thoughts, which means that your jealousy or your spirit of jealousy and envy is not the same as God being jealous. Amen? Exodus 34, 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Why is he so jealous? First of all, God doesn't like rivalry. He's a God that can't be rivaled. Many people pit God and Satan as enemies to each other, but Satan is an angel. His enemy is Michael and Gabriel. But God has no equal. He has no rival. He has no competition. He is unmatched. He has the undefeated belt because nobody can fight him. So he's jealous because he doesn't like playing he don't really like playing with you. He's also very big in getting his glory. And any time you have another God, you've allowed that thing to take God's glory. What's so powerful about that is, I was studying the book of uh, Judges. I was studying Gideon's story. They can stand, it don't matter, they can stand. Y'all can sit there, if y'all can stand there if you want. I don't care where nobody stand tonight because we finna pray. But in the book of Judges, we know that Gideon won this really big war because he fought his father's idols, tore him down. In the next chapter, he was getting ready to take about 20,000 men with him to fight and God said, that's too many, they're gonna steal my glory, I'm gonna just let you go with 300. So they know without a doubt that it was only the hand of the Lord that won this battle. But I thought it was something so weird that happened in the next chapter. And the Bible says that he ended up taking his winnings and turning it into a snare to his father's house because he made it into an image. And the Bible says literally, because he made this thing an image, which took God's glory, Gideon died for that. Did you guys know that? It's a powerful story. Now, why is this so important? And I'm gonna to try to break this down, I don't know, in the simplest way possible. How many people like to be cheated on? How many of you are in open marriages? How many of you have been cheated on before? Does it feel good? Somebody asked me, why, are, why does it seem like unbelievers are so much more confident than Christians are? And I said, that's because anytime you cheat on your husband or your wife, the relationship loses confidence, right? Why are unbelievers so much confident than um, 
unbelievers is because they're faithful to their God because their God doesn't require anything of them. So they can go in any room, they can demand any negotiation, they can do anything they want because they have full confidence that their God is gonna give them what they want. Why are you not confident? Because you're not faithful. Because anybody who is faithful to God can stand in front of anybody and say, I dare you. Because there's a certain level of confidence that happens when you keep your covenant with God and you stop going into other covenants with the devil. It was Reverend Grandpa James Solomon that said, you renew your covenant with the devil daily and don't even know it. Masturbation, renewed covenant. Pornography, renewed covenant. Sex outside of marriage, you've renewed your covenant. Sex in a dream, wake up, don't pray against it, covenant renewed. Last year, God said that it was the year of the bride. This year, what was the, we talked about marriages and we really focused a lot on that, but the bride was really the bride of Christ. You guys understand that, right? It was the church. And we are God's ecclesia. I don't know if you know that. The word ecclesia means called out ones. So you are the church. I know people hate when people say that, but it's true. You're the church. And I think God showed everybody during the pandemic that the four walls of your church couldn't save you. I think what the pandemic taught us all was that it was every man for themselves and we're gonna test your relationship with God. Because the true definition of the church was God's called out ones, his ecclesia, us. Do you guys understand that? And what happened, most of us went whoring after other gods. And I know y'all don't like when I call y'all a hoe. But I looked it up in the Bible and the word whoring was there. It's in the book of Revelations. And many of you went whoring after other gods. And you may say, why would people leave the comfort of God to go whore after someone else? Something else, a thought process, a man, a woman, a job. Anything that you love more than your obedience to God has become a God you're whoring after. It could even be a promise God gave you that you have turned into something you're whoring after. Now, why do people do that? Number one, God has a standard that we are to live by, but the image or the person or the thought that we have now doesn't. So that's one of the reasons you go whoring after God, another God. It's because it doesn't require you anything of you. Number two, people want a less demanding God. So it's easier to, you know what? I'm not even gonna plead the blood and spend time in prayer. I'm gonna take my sage and I'm gonna just go like this and twirl it around me and my house and I'm just going to. But if you knew that the origin of sage was an Indian tradition called to conjure up the dead. And because of your ignorance, you are now saging your house with demonic covenants of conjuring up the dead. Just like you can't play with the Ouija board and say you're just doing it for fun. It's the same way you shouldn't be throwing around the smoke bundle of sage around your house. But the sage is less demanding than God is. Your crystals are less demanding than God is. Your tarot cards and your angel numbers. How many know the angel numbers are of the devil? So just in case you see your favorite influencer playing around with angel numbers, I want you to know that you should go ahead and unfollow. Because they have tapped into something that's not God. Unless you can find me where God used angel numbers in the Bible, then they shouldn't be used out of the Bible. Most of the time when you begin to see triple numbers or quadruple numbers, you go to Google, am I correct? Google takes you directly to New Age websites. And as you dig deeper and deeper, you end up creating a bond or a covenant with that information you were never supposed to be with anyway. What's the third reason that people go whoring after other gods? By nature, God created us to worship. Soon as we were born, in our, in our mother's womb, the Bible says that John was filled with the Holy Ghost. 
You were created to worship. And whenever you walk outside of the will of God, whenever you go into sin, it doesn't stop your nature from worshiping it. You just need to find another God to worship. So you go and find another God to worship because by nature, you have to bow down to something. And the fourth reason you go whoring after other gods is just plain deception. And this is the reason why it's important for all of us to know what the new covenant is. How many of you feel like you really know the benefits of the new covenant? Wow. It's like five people raised their hands. And this is not to be ashamed, but wow. Imagine having a car insurance policy. Well, that's a bad ex example because I don't know nothing that my car insurance policy say I'm supposed to have in it. Imagine having Give me a, I don't know what none of that say. I'm telling y'all, I need a good example, huh? Okay, we can use health insurance. I'll use that, because y'all know more about health insurance than apparently in the new covenant. But imagine you have Imagine you have a million dollars in your bank account. And imagine you don't know that you had a million dollars in your bank account. And what happens, you end up using money that you didn't have to pay for something that you probably needed because you didn't know it was already bought. You end up using and struggling and praying and doing extra work for something that you already have here, you just don't know it. Well, the new covenant is your million dollars in the bank account. Obviously, it's worth more than that. I'm using an analogy right now. And what you're doing in your daily lives is you're paying for something that the blood has already bought. So when you sin, you're paying for it with guilt and shame and condemnation. Many of you are sitting in here with that today. If you make a mistake or an on purpose, you sit and waddle on it for days because you can't imagine that God forgave you, but it was already paid for. You just didn't go in a bank account and take a withdrawal and say, this was already paid for. I want to go ahead and give you my money for it. When the enemy starts to lie to you in your body and you begin to feel a pain or something that's going on that you know isn't normal and you say, you know what, let me go and take medicine, let me go to the doctor, let me go and try to fix this, instead of saying, you know what, I have a check for that too. Because in the bank account that he gave me with the blood, he's already paid for my healing. Let me go ahead and withdraw this and pay it back. I don't have to do anything extra. I don't have to toss around. I don't have to turn around. I don't have to cry and tarry for too long because it was paid for. And all that's required is a revelation of what Jesus did on the cross for you, which is why, oh my gosh, I'm begging you, and maybe I'll just turn it into a series, but the new covenant. My God. I feel like the heart of God is just grieved. I feel like we have so much work to do and the Bible says through knowledge are the just delivered. Through what you know, through the studying of this book, are you delivered? You email me and asking, Tiffany, can you do deliverance prayer on me? When the last time you picked this up? When? Because even if it happened, the deliverance won't stay because you don't have the information to keep it.
But I think this is indicative of the marriage covenant we walk into with God and don't know what that covenant stands for. I think it's an example of the physical covenant we make with God, with marriages, with physical marriages on the earth, and you don't know what that covenant represents, which is why the, the statistics are 50% of Christian marriages fail. But we know how now because nobody knows what a covenant is. Now there are requirements to making a, uh, there are requirements to choosing who's gonna be on the Lord's side. And I'm just gonna share what those three requirements are right now. But the first one is you're gonna need to make a decision. You're just gonna need to make a decision. I want everybody to make a decision now. The Bible says it's in 1 Kings 18. Go with me there really quickly. Verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. And the Bible says that the people answered him not a word. I want you to go with me to Revelations chapter 3. Verses 15 through 16. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to just spew you out of my mouth. How many know that's not a good thing? God is disgusted at your lukewarmness. Just like you would be disgusted as a man who won't make a decision about you. Just like you would be disgusted as, at a woman who would not make a decision about you. You know that man that leaves you in a holding pattern. The man that hovers over you and you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do because you keep asking you, baby, if you don't put your foot down tonight and say, if either we moving forward or I'm leaving. Okay, I'm telling y'all how I got my ring. Baby, because how long you gonna hop between two opinions? I know it's been 15 days. Baby, you better make a decision about me today. But a decision needs to be made. And I think it's very powerful that we learned during the year of the bride that marriages weren't what we thought it was. Marriages are actually an in, in, indication that a curse has been broken. You guys remember that? Jeremiah, 7, Jeremiah 16, 17, Jeremiah 25, he says, I'm going to cease from this land the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of joy, the voice, the voice of mirth. I'm going to stop it from existing. Why? Because idolatry had taken place on the land. And whenever idolatry takes place on the land, God cursed the land. You may say, well, what does this have to do with marriages? God created husband and wives so powerful on the earth that whenever they got together and they began to decree a thing, it had to happen. He said, God made woman and husband, wife and husband so powerful that he said, I can't even, this is God, God couldn't even stop their prayers because he couldn't, inter he couldn't intercept with the power that he gave them. He says, so because I made them so powerful, I'm just gonna take their voices away because they might have mercy like Moses did when, I, when he wanted to curse those people and, and Moses stood in front of them and said, no, take me out. And he didn't want that. So he said, I'm just gonna take their voices away. And the Bible says that when they ended up repenting in Jeremiah 33, he said, the, the place that was once desolate that not even a dog could live in, I am now going to restore the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice that says, great, your mercy is good and, and endureth forever. Why did he do that? Did you notice that before he restored the land, because God could have just restored the land when he felt like it, right? But God said, proof that I'm restoring the land is me reintroducing marriages back on this land. 
God didn't restore the land. He used the husband and wife to restore the land. And proof that the land was restored, proof that the plague had stopped, proof that the land had been cured from the curse that was put on it because of their idolatry was the marriages coming back together again and restoration taking place. Anytime God says, I'm going to restore it, then he adds speed to it. I'm going to restore to you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust stole from you. I'm going to restore it. Speed is added to whatever God is restoring. If that is the case in the Bible, can you imagine if this was a continuation of the year of the bride where the bride stands up to the bridegroom and we all enter into the new covenant with God and we keep our covenant with God as we would want our spouse to keep our covenant with us. And you're going to see regions and nations and bloodlines and families and ministries restored. I was sharing my, my testimony with Pastor Nathaniel Bassey and I said, on my mother's side of the family and on my father's side of the family, no women my, my generation are married, not one. On my father's side, I'm sorry, there's maybe two, two cousins that are married, but I got like 25,000 of them. None are married. All of my men cousins that are in my generation, saved or unsaved, been married for 35,000 years. Every last one of them. So when you saw this happen, yes, of course, I'm excited about my husband. But what this was indication of was that the curse broke. I said what it was indication of was that the curse broke, not just in my bloodline, but it covered by God. Not just in my bloodline, but in the region I live in. Not just in my bloodline, but for the generation that God has called me to. Because I don't know if you know this, but there's an attack on marriages. This was not just about a marriage. This was bigger than that. That no woman is married. And I took last year, and that's when I got a revelation of it. I didn't really, you know, sometimes you don't really be paying attention to much. You just be like, okay, well, I mean, where are you at? Cause I'm fine. I don't know what y'all think about yourself, but you know what I'm saying? And once I noticed that this was spiritual, maybe I took them prayers and them fastings much more serious than you could ever imagine. I say that to say, Whenever you see a curse broken, God is adding restoration. And what you saw might have been a shower of blessing, but I told you I saw the Lord, I heard the Lord say there's going to be a torrential downpour of blessings of marriages. And this is not just for y'all to get married and have fun, even though you're going to have a blast. It is indication that a curse has broken on the earth. But I heard the Lord say, he wants you to go back into covenant with him first. That the year of the bride is going to be the bride and the bridegroom coming back together again. And this is why I believe God is saying he needs everybody to make a decision tonight. Because he's the bridegroom saying to you, you're not gonna keep playing me with these other gods. Because your yoni steam that you like sitting on. If you Google yoni right now, you'll realize that she's a Hindu goddess that you're steaming your vagina up with. She's also the god of fertility. That is idolatry. The honey pot products you're using. On the side of the box, she said her ancestors came to her in a dream and gave her those ingredients. When you look up the article of her interview, she says she practices Santeria. 
which is Hispanic voodoo that you're putting in your vagina. That's idolatry. So when I say God is requiring your fidelity, just like you wouldn't want your man, because how many of you know all cheating isn't just sex? Some cheating is emotional. So you may say, well, I'm not bowing down to no other God, but you're cheating with honeypot is emotional. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God is requiring fidelity. So a decision needs to be made. That's number one, that's one way you, God is requiring, that's one of the requirements to deciding who's on the Lord's side. Number two, an action is required. Somebody say an action. That action tonight is repentance. It doesn't get more complicated than that. It doesn't get more. When I got saved out of my shower August 2015, it was not lucrative for me to get saved. It was not beneficial for me to get saved. It, I was not at my wit's end. I didn't come to God technically at rock bottom. I mean, I was low, but I wasn't that low. You know what I'm saying? But when I repented, I made a complete 360 or 180. I don't know which one. I failed math. 180. You're talking about Saul to Paul. You're talking about my friend had to let herself with the key to my house because I wouldn't answer the door because God had me, the second I got saved, he put me in a spirit of prayer and fasting. The spirit of prayer and fasting. I would look up, six hours went by. I would start praying at 10 p.m. I looked up, it was six. She would come and she goes, what is wrong with you? Because I got saved overnight. I didn't ease my way into this. I didn't say, give me some time. I'm just a babe. You need to give me some grace. Now, God didn't have none for me. And she said, what is going on? You look different. Because how many of you know when you spend time with God, your countenance changes? How many of you know that when you spend time with God, people can tell that something's not the same anymore? An action of repentance changes you. And again, repentance is not your tears. Repentance is not you crying out to God saying you're sorry again for the 15,000th time, just like you wouldn't want the man to say sorry to you 15,000 times. Repentance is saying, I am sorry. I did it. I'm guilty. I have no excuse for myself. But what you better bet is that you won't see me in that position again, God. I'm not doing it. Now, I'm going to be transparent for the sake of why not. What y'all going to do? Y'all done talked about me like a dog already two weeks ago. I love you too. But I am not of the thought that if I had sex outside of marriage, I'm going to hell. Boy, you can hear a pin drop. This is no license for you all to have sex outside of marriage. I am just not of that thought. I think that maybe if I slipped up five times or six and Jesus blew the trumpet, maybe I could make it in. So what I think. However, the reason I didn't and have not fallen into sexual sin is because when I repented, I turned from that life. So even in the doctrine of Tiffany, because you see how it's easy for me to come up with my own doctrine. You see how it's easy for me to marry my feelings and say, you know what? God loves me. I'm his baby. I'm his beloved. You touch me. You touch the apple of God's eye. God don't play about me. Jehovah don't play about me. I wish y'all would. It's easy to walk into that thinking that God is not going to do anything to you. But that's how easy it is for you to fall into the doctrine of your emotion, the doctrine of your feelings, because in some ways you can make that a God but I have a system in place to stop me from my own demise, which is the word of God. And because I know that I could repent for having sex and then do it again, 
that means I'm not technically repenting in the biblical way of what repentance means. Much like how when it's time to fast and y'all want to turn a boiled a boil peanut into a raw vegetable. Ooh, honey, y'all worked me that three days. I said, Lord, I know these people ain't this slow. Somebody was like, it's a falafel of raw vegetable? I said, but you cannot sin and sin again and sin again and sin again and say, I repent, I repent, I repent, I repent and think that's going to fly. Because the biblical definition of the word repentance is to turn. It literally is defined as a change of mind. It literally is defined as to think differently. It is defined as a reverse in your decision. Matthew 3, 8 and Luke 3, 8 both say the same thing. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Therefore, bring forth fruits meet for your repentance. We should see the fruit on your life based off of repentance. The third requirement to know who's on the Lord's side is separation. I want to take you to Exodus 36, 26. Exodus 36, well, yes, 26. When he asked the people who is on the Lord's side, am I in the right place? Thank you, Exodus 32. When he asked the people who is on the Lord's side, the baby's fine. He's just babying. The Bible says, let him, he said, let him come up to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So these group of people decided, I'm going to be on the Lord's side. I don't know if you know what happened, but you remember when Moses took the children of Israel through Pharaoh, through all of the plagues. Remember when Moses took the children of Israel through the, God parted the Red Sea. Can you imagine all of these people seeing a mighty move of God? A miracle. The Bible, the historians say that the waves went up so high, it was like a hundred feet or a thousand feet high. Like a tsunami. And after that great victory, Moses went back to the mountain. And I guess he stayed there a little too long for the people. You know what they said? Aaron, he's up there too long. We need another God. Can you imagine? But how many times have you done that to God? How many times have you gotten a victory from God and you said, this is good, but I'm going to turn because I need another God? How many times have you gotten a victory from God and you slapped God in the face by going to worship something else? I find a lot of the times that we're not, too many, we're not too many different from the children of Israel. The Bible says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what became of him. And you know what this fool Aaron did? Imagine. He said, go ahead and give me your earrings. Everybody take off your earrings. Give me your earrings. And that man took a fire and built them a God and a, and a statue of earrings. That's how little they thought of God. And the Bible says in verse 8, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So he didn't just go far to build a God. He built an altar for it. Why? Because he enjoyed what he built with his hands. He liked the applause of people. How many you know that everybody can't be a leader? Many people thought that Aaron was his successor, but Aaron really was led by the opinions of people. Y'all will catch that when you get home. The Bible says that Lord, verse 7, went to Moses and said, hey, go and get them people, because they've started to corrupt themselves. I just wanted to give you a background so then you understood why he said, Moses said, 
who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. And the sons of Levi gathered themselves together. You can read the rest when you get home. But he stood in the gap. Moses stood in the gap for the people of Israel because he did not want God to kill them because God was getting ready to kill them. What I thought was very powerful is the last verse that says, and the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron had made. Now you'll see that quite a few people were saved from this, but the Lord plagued the people because of the golden calf that was made. The reason God is asking who is on the Lord's side is because there is a plague about to hit this earth. And unless you kill the gods that you've been serving and tear down those altars and come back to God and say, God, I want to be covenanted with you again tonight. The plague. How many of you remember at the very beginning of COVID, I think it was, no, it was the very beginning of the word, the madmen. I gave a prophetic word. I said, madmen are getting ready to come. I said, pray before it hits your house. How many of you remember me saying that? Y'all know I was butchered in my comments for saying that. I rebuke you, you're a witch. How dare you curse God's people? And all I said is pray before it happens. And guess what it did? It happened. It happened. So I'm gonna say the same thing to you tonight. Pray before the plague hits your house. One thing about a warning, this is what's so powerful about God if you knew who you were. Warnings are not bad. Warnings are mercy. Repentance is not bad, it is mercy. Anytime God is warning you about something, because guess what? Stuff happens to people all the time and it catches them off guard. If you are a child of God, nothing should catch you off guard. If you're not having a dream, somebody else should be around you. If you don't hear God in this season, he's speaking all the time in a book called the Bible. Some people say, Tiffany, what do I do? This is my silent season. I know you're not reading the word of God. You want to know why? Because sometimes God goes, God goes silent when he knows that he can't trust what voice you hear anymore. Because when you have too many influences in your ear, you don't know which one is God. That's why you say, I think I heard God. I'm not sure. Well, I don't know if this was the voice of God or not. I think I heard God. I believe I heard God. You would know for sure. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through, verses 15 through 20. I think this story is so powerful. But Moses, I mean, the, if Moses wasn't born yet, but the Pharaoh realized that these people were getting too great for him and he needed to kill them off. So the Bible says in verse 15 that the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. The Hebrew midwives, y'all. Of which one was named Shafra and the other name was Pyo. And he said... When ye do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, kill it. If it's a daughter, then it can live. I want you to underline the office of a midwife. We know about the office of an apostle. We know about the office of a prophet. But how many of you know that there was an office of a midwife? That he gave them a command that when they helped anybody give birth, to kill it. What is a midwife? Obviously we know it's somebody that helps people give birth, but a midwife is really defined as somebody to cause or help to bring forth. It is somebody to cause or to help to bring forth. Pharaoh's goal was to kill off a generation and these midwives, how many of you ever heard people say, you better obey the law of the land? How many of you heard people say that? 
people get it. You said it. Okay, I, repentance. Thank you. You better obey the law of the land. You better, oh, you're in rebellion. But how many of you know right here, these brave women who stood in the office of the midwife, which means that there were other midwives in the area, they were just the leaders of them. They had a choice to obey either Pharaoh or God. And the Bible says, verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men child alive. And you know what God did because of their obedience to him? Now historians say that midwives were midwives back in that day because they could not bear their own children. And so they took up the job of helping others give birth. And God said, because you have done this, I'm going to give you your own children. Can I submit to you today that there are people in here today, whether you're a man or a woman, in the office of a midwife, that God is calling to birth and to cause the birth and to cause to come out. And you are responsible for getting somebody's destiny out. And I hear the Lord saying that there are laws being passed right now. There are religious systems right now that are coming against people of God, that God wants something birthed through. And you are going to stand up in the church. You're going to stand up in the realm of politics. You're going to stand up in the realm of social media. You're going to stand up and be the one that cries out in the wilderness. And you're going to say, I'm not going to kill that one. I'm going to save it. I might got to lie to you about it, but it's for a good reason. When you hear who is on the Lord's side, I never want Exodus 1 to get out of your mind. These women weren't warriors. These women were not trained army technicians. These women were responsible for birthing a next generation. And in the face of making a decision, they showed you that they were on the Lord's side. I too stand in the office of a midwife. I stand in a lot of, I'm, I'm in the office of a daughter. I'm in the office of a prophet. I'm in the office of a teacher. And I'm also in the office of a midwife. And what you saw was the world wanting me to kill the voice of the next generation of people that are coming during my generation that is gonna cry loud and spare a lot. They say, kill it, kill it, don't say nothing, just kill it. And I had a decision, fear God or fear people. When you're faced with that decision, what are you gonna choose? I saw some people defend me on social media and then when the comments came in, they erased it. You wanna know why? Because they couldn't stand up to the pressure. But how many of you know that God will give you the capacity to handle the pressure that comes with your calling. How many of you know that God has anointed you to handle the pressure that comes with the calling? How many of you know that when he pours the anointing oil over your head, just like they did with sheep back in the day, you know why anointing oil, when the sheep were uh, back in the day, the sheep had flies and insects bothering them all in their ears, all in their eyes, all in their nose. And the shepherd would take the anointing oil and pour it over the sheep so that now these insects just slid down. That once irritated them and once bothered them because they don't have arms that they can knock it off themselves, they were being tortured by something they could not kill. And the shepherd poured anointing oil over them so that it would not torture them. How many of you know tonight that the great shepherd is pouring anointing oil over you? That he is giving you instructions for your assignment. When we pray, you're going to hear the instructions for your next assignment. When you pray, you're going to hear the next set of instructions. Many of you say, God, what am I supposed to do next? And I hear the Lord saying, what? You're supposed to ask him, what did you tell me to do last? But the Lord is anointing you for this assignment. I said at the beginning of this message, what tried to kill you, God just made you a cure for. What tried to kill you, God just made you a cure for. I was just studying this the other day, but people that are bit by rattlesnakes, 
Whenever they have that venom in them, in order to make an antibody, they take the same venom and put it in the person to save their life. I don't know how many of y'all watch World War Z, but I'm a big fan. And if you watch that movie, did y'all watch it? Because I'm finna ruin it. Okay, because it came out in 2009, so y'all just out of luck at this point. Watch it and just be surprised. But the whole world came down with something and the only nation that stood with it was Israel. And what did he find as the cure to this? He found the most deadliest diseases that he had to inject himself with. And when he went back through the zombies, they couldn't find him anymore because God is using in this season what tried to kill you as a cure. I pray you get a revelation of that. I'm gonna say it one more time. God is going to use what tried to kill you as your cure. That what you went through wasn't just for you. What you went through wasn't just to try to take you out. What you went through was an extreme exercise to see how long you could stand. What you went through was an extreme exercise to let everybody else know you can't take me down. What you went through was an extreme exercise with the world watching to let them know that if I have the Lord that is on my side. Because this generation needs proof that people have the Lord on their side. This generation needs proof that people are not afraid of you. This generation needs proof that if you play with one of God's, you're going to be dealt with. Many of you tonight are in the office of a midwife. And in the days to come, you know, they talk about the goddess Astaroth. You all, many of us know about, we pray, we don't, we don't know who Astaroth is. Do y'all know who Astaroth is? But y'all know what I'm talking about, right? They were like the prophets of Baal, the uh, Astaroth, all of those things. How many of you know that Astaroth back in that day was the God that was over transgendered? She was also the God over politics. What do you see today other than the transgender agenda arising like crazy? because they're trying to erect the goddess of Astaroth back in this generation. How many, I, I don't know about y'all, but not on my watch. I don't know about y'all, but I said not on my watch. I don't know about y'all, but God has raised up a generation of warriors. God has raised up a generation of Deborahs. God has raised up a generation of JLs. God has raised up a generation of people who say not on my watch. You have many that say, Let's just let God handle it. That's not, that's not, but that's not what the Bible says. God says that he uses people to handle it. I heard a man, I heard a man of God say, I'm not bothering God. He sent me. What's up? And that needs to be our posture in this season. Go ask God about it. Why? He sent me. What's up? I don't know about y'all, but I read a book called the Bible and I was just crazy enough when I got saved and they would say a tornado was coming to North Carolina and I would read, I had maybe just got done reading Elijah and I would get up off my couch and I would go outside and I would stare it and I said, not on my watch! Cause I don't know how to survive in a hurricane. You can't come here. I don't want my house to lift up and twirl around and fall somewhere else. I don't know how to go, I don't know where to go. Should I go to my bathtub? Should I stand in the frame of my doorway? Too many thoughts, you can't come. Did I laugh when I did it? Sure, because I'm a funny person. But that doesn't stop me from going out there and pointing my finger at the sky and saying, if I have the authority in the name of Jesus Christ, not on my watch. Come on, we hear testimonies. I know a woman of God that had a psychic building next to the house. They had just erected the psychic building right there. And she said, not on my watch. Baby, put some prayer pressure to that and that thing came tumbling down. They went out of business. Cause you can't stay here on the street I live on. You won't corrupt this. 
God is calling a people back to their place of authority. And you can't stand in authority when you don't know covenant. You can't have a healthy marriage when you don't know covenant. I'm gonna tell this testimony again because I think it's powerful and because many people like to lie on me. But how many of you know the Bible says that you ought not bear false witness against somebody? How many of you know that the Bible says that you shouldn't lie on Tiffany? You should at least say what Tiffany said. Because before I take it away, I'm going to just add to it. Amen? Because who ain't scared of me, y'all is me. So find y'all somebody else to lie on. But I want, you, I want to share with y'all how powerful covenant is. And I shared this story before, but for the sake of people messing up my words right now and saying that I curse people and I advocate for people cursing people, I'm going to share the story again. I knew a woman. I know a woman. A mother in Zion. She's about 80 years old. And her husband cheated on her. They've been married for like 60 years, probably 40 of them. She shared this story publicly. She wrote a book on it, all that. There was one mistress that her husband had and the woman said over her dead body is she gonna leave that lady husband alone. Now mother didn't know much about God back in that day. She had just gotten saved. She was a baby Christian. She didn't know where her authority was. But she did know that she could go and tarry in prayer because that's what she was good at, praying. And what she said to me was, she never prayed that the woman died. She never wished that on her. But she went to God and said, God, this lady said over her dead body, I can't get my husband back. So I don't know if you could just break them up, if you can, I don't know, I just need my husband back. And the next week the lady dropped dead. And mother's husband was so sad about it that she ironed his clothes so she can go to the lady funeral. I said, ma'am, you a better woman than I'll ever be. Because I dare him to go. Honey, if don't nobody else make it up to heaven, you got a front row seat. You want to know why that story is so powerful? Because what she didn't know was that covenant spoke for her. What she did not know was that her covenant had answered for her when she did not know it was going to answer for her. Go with me. I don't know where it's at in the Bible. Can somebody just yell it out where it says, tell this mountain to be removed? What is it? All right. Thanks, guys. The Bible says, for verily I say unto you that whatsoever shall say, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, could be the mountain of the side chick, could be the mountain of disease, could be whatever your mountain is. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall, she shall have what? Whatsoever he saith. Is it whatsoever he thinketh? Just whatsoever he saith, right? So I was curious. And I looked up the word removed. Because I'm like, what does that mean? You know, guys, I look up all my words. Because I'm just fascinated by words. And so I saw the regular words to raise up from the ground, to elevate, to move from its place, uh, to take off or away what is attached to anything. But there was another definition that I thought was powerful, and it is to take from among the living, either by natural death or by violence. That's scripture. That's not Tiffany. Don't get mad at me. Y'all do a YouTube about me. Thank you, because you just gave me 15,000 new subscribers. But what I gave you was scripture, not my opinion. Amen? Because what we don't know is our authority when you come into covenant with God. Pastor Nathaniel Bassey, we, we hear this beautiful love melody. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we waited for shall come to pass. See what the did I tell y'all he was coming to Houston March 19th at, for Cover by God on a Sunday evening? I'm going to release the tickets. Don't worry this week. Y'all should be a little bit more excited about that. 
baby, because he's coming to blow the trumpet, okay? But I don't know if you guys remember how that song came about. And he said he had a friend, it was William McDowell, they had a building, and he t shared his testimony the last time he was at Covered by God, but he said, he said, I have this building that I want to get for the church, but the government won't let us have it. And one of them said, over their dead body, could they get the building? And that's when Minister Nathaniel said, what you never do to a governing child of God is say, over your dead body. Now, of course, they didn't even have to pray that because you did it to yourself. And they just prayed, God, we want this building. Let it be released. Let your will be done. In the name of Jesus, remove whoever is in the way. Remove whoever is in. You just got to use the word remove because God does the removing how he want to remove it. Three months later, they got the building over that man's dead body. I am not advocating for killing anybody. I have never prayed that anybody has died. God is my witness on that. But what I am saying is that when you understand covenant and you understand who you are and whose you are, that anything standing in your way, you say be removed, it's God that does the removing and he decides how he's going to do that depending on what he knows is going on that you don't know. And then the last scripture I want to share with you is 1 Kings 18. We often know that scripture and he says, who is on the Lord's side? He said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? I think what's powerful about this scripture is the people, the prophets of Baal. Remember he, Elijah used his mouth to shut up the heavens that it did not rain for three and a half years. Remember that? And then he opened up the heavens so that it rained after the altars were broken. Why was it the prophets of Baal he was going after? Because the prophets of Baal, Baal was known as the weather god. Baal was known as the god that was over the weather system. And he said, hey, I'm not judging your god. I'm just saying, let the god that answers by fire, let him be god. I've been saying since 2022, and I'm going to say it again, but God is coming after your idols. I heard the warning so strongly that almost every day I pray against idolatry, just in case. I heard the word so strongly that I won't even allow y'all to make me an idol because how many of you know that there are some people that stand up here that love the applause and praises of men? I'm not one of them. You won't get me in trouble with God. I'll never steal his glory. This is why I always try to tell you, take me off of whatever pedestal y'all want me on. I'm just like you, probably just a little bit more bolder, probably a little bit more obedient, but I'm just like you. He is no respecter of persons. If you prayed and read your Bible, he'll speak to you too. I am no different. I didn't go to theology school. I'm thugging it out in this Bible. Every day. Thus saith, doeth. Doing the best I can, guys. But there is a separation. The third one was, is required is a separation. And God is going to call you. The crazy thing about a separation is how many of you know that it, the things that you're siding with God means that sometimes you're going to have to side against the things you once loved. Siding with God means that you're going to have to sometimes side against people, systems, structures, ministries, things of that nature, politics, things you once advocated for, things you once proudly stood up and marched on the altar for like your Greek organizations. I prophesy as a prophet of God, I prophesy to you now that those organizations are going down. Don't mark my word, mark God's. When you saw those people marching on that altar, that was a desecration of God's altar. I heard the Lord say, I'm dealing with or Greek organizations. And you're going to, see, as a sign that God has heard me, you will see it. You will see a mass exodus coming out of Greek organizations and into repentance to God. You will see them lose the power that, that, that God was supposed to hold and now they're holding. I'm telling you, God is coming back for his people. He's coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a pure bride 
And as long as you're in a Greek organization, you're not one of them. Because the same oath, the same proclamation, the same, all of that that you made with that organization was the one you were supposed to make to God. Many of you made that proclamation when you were 18 years old, 21 years old, you're 40, 45 years old. No shake, just go read it again tonight. Don't be so offended by me that you can't hear what I'm saying right now. Just go read it tonight. And if you have the Holy Ghost, you will not just go into repentance and say, God, I did not know. I repent, I denounce it. You will also write them a letter and say, I denounce this organization, take me out. You will become like the midwives and you will get on social media and you will begin to be a Moses for your generation. And you will say, look what I have learned. I'm crying out for a mass exodus. Now I can only speak so much about it because I've never been in one because y'all was never going to jump me. You won't never take me into the woods and paddling me on the book. I'm not going through none of that. I'm going to swing on you. We're going to fight. Just wasn't my thing. But you cannot in good faith call this organization God knowing what the hazing process was like. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He's our creator. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He's our preserver. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He is the healer. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He's the preventer. It only chooses, it only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He is the way maker. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He's the protocol breaker. It only makes sense to choose to be on the Lord's side. He's the defender. It only makes sense to choose on the Lord, to be on the Lord's side. He's the strong tower. There's no other option to have outside of the option of God. So I ask you again today, who is on the Lord's side? You choosing to be on the Lord's side is gonna offend many people. But the true gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. To know that there is a man that died for you. They locked him up in a cave and put a stone over it. And he had the nerve to raise up from the dead three days later is offensive. The fact that this man's blood fell off of his body and because of the blood shed on Calvary was for the remission of your sins. Just like somebody, a cancer patient goes into remission. What is remission? It means the cancer stopped. So if the blood shed was to go into remission for your sins, it means that whatever the Bible says that the wages of sin are death, which means that the second you sin, death is on your way, baby. Premature death is on your way. The generational curse of death is on your way. The word curse of death is on your way. Time release curses of death is on your way. Death is on your way. But he said the second you repent and the blood was shed on Calvary, there's a remission of the sin, which means I've stopped it in the track. You're not gonna die for what you did because even though you paid for sin and I was gonna pay you back with death, when you repented, the remission of sin came in and it stopped it in his tracks, you're now free. You've been pardoned from the sin. Amen? Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. The fact that God created people to do his will on earth is offensive. Guys, I don't take no for an answer, never. You tell me no, what do I say? I'm talking to the wrong person. You want to know why? Because God, the person, the God whose side I chose breaks protocols for Tiffany. Which means that if it's something that I want and it's within the boundary of God, I should have it. Which means that if you told me no, I'm going to just go to somebody else until I get a yes because it belonged to me because God is breaking protocol. And y'all give up on the second and third ask. You give up on the second and third try. You give up when they tell you no 15 times. I dare you not. The answer is yes, and I'm talking to the wrong person. Can I talk to somebody else other than you, please? Guess what that was? Offensive to somebody who thought you shouldn't carry that much authority. You standing in your power and authority and telling sickness, go! 
is offensive to sickness that have run in your bloodline for 40 generations. Who do you think you are to stand there having just been saved for six months, learning your authority overnight and telling me to go? And I've been a familiar spirit in this bloodline. I had your mama and your grandmama. I had your great grandma, your great great grandmama. I had them a hundred generations ago. I was the Goliath. And you think, who do you think you are? Who's your covering? Who's your pastor? You sure? Did, did I really need all those prerequisites to cast out a demon? Did cover by God not answer your question of who my covering is? But that's what they're saying to you. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to tell me to go? I was on my way to your daughter. I was getting ready to touch your son. I was getting ready to ruin your marriage like all the other late marriages and divorces and separations and the people that still marry but hate their husband. I was on my way to your house. Who do you think you are? Because how many of you know that success in God doesn't take time, success in God takes God? That you can get saved in one night and the Holy Ghost will give you a revelation that will transcend generations and save your life and save the life of your generation. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, most of the church people were mad at me about what I said because they had gotten tickets to the concert already. That's why they were mad, honey. I spent thousands of dollars on tickets to the concert and because they were still going to go, even though they had been warned, they had to fight against me so that they can post their pictures. But how many of you know they chose that day to serve mammon? Mammon is a tricky demon. It comes in the area of what you're not willing to let go of even if you have to count it a loss. So we're getting ready to pray a prayer of repentance. I'm gonna have Chicago's own prophetess Keisha Cephas. How many of you know that you don't need the spirit of boldness? You find out a lot about that in the book of Acts. But the spirit of boldness is something that only the Holy Ghost can give you. That when he says, I'm setting your face like a flint for a generation that has turned their backs to God. So tonight, what's getting ready to happen is that a spirit of boldness is gonna come upon the people of God once again. We're going to see a move of God like in the book of Acts. They will try to jail you, they will try to do all of that, but I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, the fear of the Lord will hit this nation again because of the fear, because of the people of God. The year of the bride will cause the fear of the Lord to hit God's people again. People will come running to your house. People will come running and say, save me, pray, I wanna be saved because of the fear of the Lord. There is a revival that is gonna take place that is going to blow, just like the pandemic blew people away by how powerful it seemingly was, is how this revival is gonna take place. But it will not take place without repentance. This revival, will, repentance will precede this revival. I'm gonna say it one more time. I heard the Lord say there is another plague getting ready to hit this land. Unless we get the body to repent and turn from their wicked ways, it will come to your house. This is not me wishing it on you. I am warning you in God's mercy so that we can turn and be covered by that. 
So tonight, as a woman of God prays, I just want you to have a sincere moment with God. I want you to repent for the sins of you, the sins of your ancestors. I want you to repent and just say, I'm sorry for everything. People email me and say, should I say sorry for this, baby? If you got to think about it, yeah, I'm sorry. I was sitting over there as Psalmist Rico was worshiping, and there was somebody that came to the forefront of my mind, and I went into forgiveness again over there, because I dare went and stand on this altar having an alt in my heart. Repentance is God's mercy. I heard the Lord say that as you repent, miracles are going to fall down. You, your clap should be a little louder than that. Because I'm not just saying this. I'm a prophet that speaks when spoken to. I don't just speak hypothetical. But I heard the Lord say when true repentance hits this house tonight, that the miracle you've been looking for will be waiting on you. During our last three-day fast, when we spoke, I said there are thousands of people that were dealing with breast issues. And I heard the Lord say, repent for resentment. The testimonies came pouring in. People had lumps, they disappeared. People had burning in their breasts, they disappeared. People, people went into a wild repentance over resentment and the pain in that area because your breasts are known as nurture. And what do women do? You nurture the pain. You nurture the resentment. You nurture the hurt. You nurture what was done wrong to you. God said once you release that and you break it off of you, you're going to feel healing in that area. You're going to be healed in that area. But tonight is going to be a night of the miraculous. So I don't care where you need to go, if you need to lay out, if you need to come to the altar, if you need to cry out to God, I'm telling you now, this is God's mercy tonight. This is God's divine protection tonight. You are up under the blood. And the Bible says, because the new covenant is the, is the new covenant blood of Jesus, that wherever he saw the blood, the death angel had to pass over it. I heard the Lord say that no longer will you hide in your cave but he is calling you out. No longer will your excuse be, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know what I'm talking about. I heard the Lord say, when you open up your mouth, I will put my words in it. I heard the Lord say, don't worry about being charismatic. Don't worry about being entertained. He said, give them the words that I say because your words will, will save a lost generation. The only word I have for Chicago is repent. Whenever God gives a word of judgment to a region, his response is repentance. That's what he hopes your response is. That's what turns the judgment around. So woman of God, come on out. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord. We ask that you forgive us of all our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blot out our transgressions. Forgive us of our iniquities. Creating us a clean heart. Renewing us the right spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, forgive us for everything that we said done against the will of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Tonight, we repent for everything that has come into our ear gate, eye gate, and out of this mouth gate that did not magnify the holy God. Father, the winds of change is in the sanctuary. The winds of change is in Chicago. Tonight, we have a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of conduct, a change of direction. Father, forgive us in the mighty name of Jesus. The horn around where other gods, for you said in your word, we are not to have any other gods except you, God. Forgive us for chasing in the mighty name of Jesus, which is another deity. Father, tonight we repent in the mighty name of Jesus for the spirit of greed that's in Chicago. In the mighty name of Jesus, we chase money, we pursue money, but tonight our pursuit changes. In the mighty name of Jesus, tonight we chase God. Tonight we pursue God. Tonight we seek God. Tonight we worship the only true and living God. Father. 
nation, a perverted city, a perverted community in the mighty name of Jesus, full of lust in the mighty name of Jesus, purify our private parts, purify what comes in the mouth, what goes out of the mouth, that comes in on tonight, forgive us for pornography, forgive us for masturbation in the mighty name of Jesus, forgive us for fornication, Root 
you up by the spirit of the true and living God. Tonight, there is a showdown between that of the true and the false. Tonight, scales are coming off the eyes of the prophet. Tonight, the true prophets arise in Chicago. Tonight, we prophesy in the name of Jesus. Words to warn, words to judge, words to reprove, words to correct. In the mighty name of Jesus, tonight we stand in the office of an apostle. In the name of Jesus, let the builders arise, let the trailblazers arise. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the evangelists go and recruit, go and scout out. In the name of Jesus, I hear you call. We snatch off the muzzle of the prophet in Chicago. In the name of Jesus, everything that's not like God, reveal it, expose it, remove it, root it up, cast it out. In the name of Jesus, tonight this city will be purified. Tonight, winds of change has come. Tonight, winds of revival shifted. Our city has changed. Our city is coming back into order. Tonight as we repent, corruption is being revealed in our city, in our community, throughout the state of Illinois. Tonight there's a shift. There's a change. I hear you God. Tonight padlocks are going upon every door that has been marked Tonight, you come to scatter in the name of Jesus. You smite the shepherd and you cause the sheep to scatter. They will go into houses where they'll be loved, where they'll be fed, where they'll be recruited, where they'll be corrected, where they'll be taught in the name of Jesus. Tonight, we bow. Tonight, we ask. Tonight, we need you. Tonight, we love you. Tonight, we chase you with our whole heart. Purify. Only the Lord thy God knows this heart. It can be wicked. It can be deceitful. It can be ugly. But tonight, the way you did, the children of Israel, give us a new heart. Give us a new mind. Give us a new spirit in the mighty name of Jesus and forgive us for taking off our armor in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the belt of truth be back in place. Let the helmet of salvation be back in place. Tonight, let the sword of the spirit of your world be back in place. Let our feet be shod with the gospel of peace tonight in the name of Jesus and let the shield of faith shield our heart forgive us for offense forgive us for grudges forgive us for unforgiveness tonight we release it tonight we let it go tonight we drop it no word says if I can't forgive my to you. Tonight we cast all of our cares upon you, God. In the name of Jesus, forgive us of malice. Forgive us of contention. Forgive us of strife. Forgive us of anger. In the mighty name of Jesus, for your word says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, that we will not enter to anger. For man's anger will never promote the righteousness of God. In the name of Jesus.
to the room tonight. The pastor, the shepherd, the one who loves the sheep. Come back into the room. Even God, forgive us for mistreating your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Preaching against the saints across the pulpit. Forgive us in the name of Jesus for being poor shepherds behind the podium. In the mighty name of Jesus, we stand for Jesus, and ask that you forgive us, and at the same time, heal your people, heal your saints, heal your sons, heal your daughters, because of this, many of our children refuse to come back into the church building, but God, clear up the narrative, you're still God, save our children, save our sons, save our daughters, save our of the heart and the way we hear in Jesus Christ's name I thank you amen While she was praying, I heard the Lord say for me to go out and anoint as many people as I could. And you all can do this when you go home. If I missed you, of course, I couldn't get everybody, but I did as many as I could. And I heard the Lord say, you have to forgive me. I don't remember where this is. It's either in Ezekiel or Revelations, and it could be both. Where he was bringing destruction to the people, and he said, but wait, let me mark my intercessors, let me mark my people. And the people that I've marked pass over them, don't touch them. I believe that's in Old Covenant and in New Covenant. And so what this was for was when you all prayed the prayer of repentance, and we can only know this by your fruit when you leave here today, 
I heard the Lord say that as you were anointed, there was a token that you belong to God. And that token is the blood of Jesus Christ. That token is the anointing. And as you go out, you can go out really fearless to say, I'm marked. I have been marked. When you leave here, I beg you to study the new covenant. I'm begging you. What you don't want to happen is another thing coming and it catches you in the middle of it because you're caught off guard. How many of you know that people thrive during those times because they weren't caught off guard? Joseph wasn't caught off guard. He prepared. I think one of the best ways we can prepare is to be knowledgeable of what the protection is we have when we decided tonight to be on the Lord's side. I love you all with the love of Christ. My message was simple and it was the fruit of repentance. It didn't need a lot of theatrics. It didn't need a lot of language for it. The decision is yours because you're all grown and you can make the right decision. But you will see the fruit of that decision this year. So I pray that as we close, you got a revelation of what God is looking for from you. You got a revelation of what God is looking for in the body of Christ. And what you got a revelation of what God is looking for in this generation. And it's a generation of fearless believers who once they come into covenant with God is indication that the curse was broke. It's that simple. The rules in the Bible are simple. But Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the revelation that went forth. We thank you for your sovereignty and your love and your kindness and your mercy. We thank you for the mercy of repentance tonight. And we pray, Father, that not only did we make the right decision, but you give us the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge of what to do now that we've made this right decision. Father, we are clear that a lot of these decisions couldn't be made in our own will. So we release self-will tonight, Father, and we declare that it is your will that we are now in covenant with. We ask, Father, that the Holy Ghost becomes best friends with everybody in here. And that they go to the Holy Ghost and listen to him more than they'll listen to anybody else. And I pray, Father, that the fruit of their repentance will bear strong in their lives and that people will begin to say, surely the hand of God is on this person's life. I pray that there is a divine turnaround in the life of everybody here. I pray that wherever it looked like lack, wherever it looked like there was a deficiency, wherever it looked like God had forgotten about you, you will see the hand of God move in your situation with speed because God is restoring you because you made the right decision tonight. I just caution you one thing, don't take God's glory. Don't say, I did this. Don't let somebody else say, I mean, you could have did this on your own. I don't care what they say. Say, I will never take God's glory. God did it. And you will eat the fruit of it. Chicago, I love you, but the one word I have for you all is repent. When you repent, you will see a revival come out of Chicago in a way you have never seen before. God is raising up a new people in Chicago. These are people that are not currently on social media. 